typically share ideas with people that are resistant to the new ideas. If, the, if you guys are following me on that and um, I'll be watching in the chat right here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn on uh, my video camera just so you guys can uh, have a visual. I'm in this fabulous hotel room in Palm Springs where it's 94 degrees right now. <laughs> Sorry not to rub it in people uh, in the Midwest. Um, but I'm really, really, yeah, exactly. And uh, Lucy, your plane's going to be okay tomorrow? You're going to make it all right? We know how to deal with snow, unlike other parts of the country. And so, um, yes. That's like not a thing. Yeah. Okay. So um, let me see here. Now, I haven't done as much with the Zoom, but I'm going to attempt to share my screen right now. Oh, here we go. Okay. So that's magical. I got this. It's okay. Really so the first thing I want... I, I want to give you guys a little rundown on um, on my background. Uh, I'm at, uh, my degree is actually in um, advertising, uh, which falls into journalism. And my wife's a teacher, and she got hit me hooked into teaching as like about a third career. I did a whole bunch of other stuff first, but I really fell in love with education. And um, what I realized right now that there's this convergence with education in in that. The days of being able to look at the kids sitting in front of you and saying, you are trapped with me because of your zip code. Like, I'm all you've got. You're in my zip code. I own you. I'm going to tell you how things go. I'm going to quote Ed code, and you're going to take it. Those days are over, you guys. We have charter schools. Betsy DeVos is going big with this. But what's even more important than that uh, negative tension aspect is when I entered teaching, I saw the 35 kids in my class as an audience to delight and surprise. I have a totally different pedagogy than, well, this is how, uh, you know, I've got this whole uh, cabinet full of worksheets on hatchet. So that's what we're doing all year, right? Like, so I'm the hatchet guy. That's what I got hatchet. And so I started really early in my career with this more of an advertising perspective of how can I make school as surprisingly delightful as possible? So um, I've got it up on my screen there. I'm going to click it into the uh, chat if you guys want to follow along uh, because I'm, again, I'm not into like dominating the conversation. So I'm going to hit stop share here real quick. I'm going to put it in the chat for you guys if you want to jump into the web page that I'm pointing at. I'm going to go back to share screen. Um, uh, uh, give me a, a quick shout out. And uh, Lucy, you can watch the chat for me because when I'm screen sharing, it's hard to see the chat. Uh, have you guys heard of the five P's of marketing? These are the five P's right here. Product, price, place, promotion, and people. And the five P's are big for advertising. And the way that I got it explained to me way back in the, in the late 80s was, if your five P's are out of balance, you have a problem. Uh, so let me see if I can contextualize this for you guys. Um, there's a product you desire. Uh, let's go with the food category because everybody gets food. Let's say that there's a steak that you really want to have, right? Like you want to go to Roos Chris and have a steak. So you know that the steak is good. Okay. So that's the first piece. The place. Is there a Roos Chris within driving range of you? Because if they're not within driving range of you, you can only go X amount of times a year, right? What's the price? Well, it just happens that a uh, a, a steak at uh, Ruth's Chris, the one I like, would be a, a bone-in ribeye, 59 bucks. So does that make it unavailable to me? No, but it limits the amount of volume. Promotion. Um, here's a great one. Uh, Ruth's Chris has gotten a hold of my wife's birthday uh, date. I wonder how that happened. And uh, about 10 days before her birthday every year, I get an email from Ruth's Chris that says, bring your wife in for her birthday. We'll give you 30 bucks off. That's the promotion piece, right? So I know you guys are, 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 as modern humans, you get this. You may not have understood the name, which is product, price, uh, place, promotion, and people. All five have to work together. Another classic example would be end caps in grocery stores. End caps sell like crazy. The, the uh, manufacturers are actually spending money to have an end cap because it's an investment that'll sell more product. So... What I want to talk to you guys about is bringing these five P's to school, right? So think about it. Um, here's my, uh, my anecdotal story to kick this off. I was working in a two-school district in the California foothills. We had River Gold and Coarse Gold, two schools. 
right? Both K6s or K8s at the time. And uh, because I'm a marketing guy, I said to myself, I want at least four kids to transfer to my school for no reason other than my classroom is better. It was just a personal challenge. I wanted to have better homework. I want to have better classwork. I want to have better customer service. I wanted kids to go home and their state reports are already done and they all had A's. And I wanted kids to truly enjoy the experience. That was my challenge to myself. And most years I met it. I had in a district that only had 600 kids, I had, or let me rephrase that, in a district that had about um, 150 total students in sixth grade, I had almost 10% moving to my classroom for one year, going to sixth grade with me and then going back to the other school. That to me felt like a quality experience, right? So the five P's are big because if you don't have those things happening, you don't have the, um, the basic genetics to get your initiative going forward. So when you're doing something like opening a new school, rolling out a new curriculum, trying to get people to adopt PBL, the five P's matter. The thing that they want, um, the thing that you need them to do needs to be affordable to them, it needs to be people-centric. It needs to make their career better. You need to promote it over and over again. How many times have you guys seen this? Um, you come into the staff meeting, and the principal goes, guess what? We're doing a new program. What's the reaction from people? They're like, what? Why is he doing this? What's going on? So it's really important to look at all of those different pieces um, to your initiatives before you roll out. Um, so any... Um, uh, Lucy, can we open the mic, or do we have uh, do we have the ability to uh, do you want to just read off some chats? Because I would love to have some questions at this point. Yeah, they can they can unmute, and they're they're being um, slightly. Are quiet. they being shy? They're being a little quiet. They'll get warmed up. Andrew's here. Hi, Andrew. So he's catching a little bit of this, and he he says that he would add. Um, well, I'll let Andrew talk for himself, but but I'll, in a second. But I'm working with a district right now that is really small i love the district they want to do exciting innovative things but they're a little bit lost in how to do it and i think it's because there's been some blaming going on um about relationships you know in terms of right. like all oh, these teachers don't want to do this or right uh, so which p would that be that's going to be people right yeah. you've got to have trust but i have trust now one of the biggest things that i'll branch off of that idea from lucy is um, I'm a big Tom Peters fan. If you guys haven't read any of his books, you definitely want to check those out if you're going to be a change agent. My, my two favorite Tom Peters books. Uh oh. Was that me? No, I lost him too. No, it's him. With that hotel Wi Fi. <laughs> At least he has nice weather, though. Yeah, really, 94 degrees, right. So, so, Andrew, what were you going to say about professionalized? Oh, I mean, I was, you know, it's, doesn't, it's not one of the five P's of marketing, but I feel like whenever you're trying to sell something to teachers, um, to, help that, to help honor them as professionals um, is really an important piece of too, as well. And so if you're bringing in a new curriculum or you've got a new initiative, um, you need to honor the expertise in the room because they made it there. Um, and I think that's a pretty important piece. Um, even though it doesn't have much to do with marketing, I, I guess, well, I mean, I think in contemporary marketing, you do need to put the consumer in a, in a role of um, producer as well and, and of someone who feels ownership of whatever product they're choosing to, to purchase. Um, and that's how you differentiate yourself in this world where we've got so much uh, competition for eyeballs and, and attention. Um, so I don't know, I'm just kind of riffing. I think, I think, you know, I agree with you and I'm, I'm sure he'll come back in a second. If he doesn't, yeah. oh well, well then we'll go on to hear part of the, part of the webinar. Right. But I also think that, uh, I think something that I've learned from your friend Don has been the inspiration part. Like I had, I didn't really um, think about, you know, I think inspiration is the impetus for motivating people like how, and, and it's our job as professional developers to say, how can I inspire people and, um, and move them? And yeah, it takes, sometimes it takes being a pretty charismatic person. Like it, you should see how people eat out of John's hand at Q. Everybody right. at the Q conference 
goes bananas for him. I, I will never be like that. <laughs> but I think what- I think that's an element though. I don't think that's totally it. Because I think if you go to a conference and you hear a keynote, it's often incredibly inspirational. And you're like, wow, that person, they just get it and they phrase things so articulately. And like, they are, they've said all the stuff that I think but can articulate myself. And that's so empower, that's so exciting. But that's the inspiration piece, which is, a, which is key and important. But I think the devil is in the, the execution and the details of getting to the, the, getting to the vision that the person is articulating. Um, and so I think they're both equally important. Um, but I mean, often, you know, you hear so like, that's why keynotes are good for inspiration and that's it <laughs> because they, they rarely talk about um, in some ways the details and how to actually get something done in 50 minutes with one person talking. Like it's always more work than just that. It's about process. And I'm back. Yeah. Oh, all right, you're back. Okay, Andrew punted for you, so it's good. <laughs> I caught that. I caught that. And, and I only heard about eight seconds of it, but I can rip off of that, which is if you're going to have a standard deliver um, staff meeting, you can expect less impact, less uptake, and you can expect teachers to model that. Right. Um, we do a thing out here called the Q Rockstar Admin uh, Camps, and one of the big things that we've really been pushing that way is the idea of doing um, your, your staff sessions as stations, um, even to the effect of that the rule of our staff meetings in our model is you're not going to explain anything to somebody face-to-face -face that you could explain by email. If they can get it by email, you're not going to do it face to face because face to face time is too is too precious. And uh, what they've done is uh, they put uh, they give each the, each of the teachers uh, about a 10 minute little scenario. Share your favorite grade book tricks. Share how you do your uh, reading lesson, and then they put them in little cohorts. And it's basically speed dating for their for their staff meetings. And what happens from that is that. Um, you get teachers talking to teachers more. Has anybody ever seen this scenario? The administrator does a really good job of explaining and then says, are there any questions? And there are literally no questions, right? That's because people don't like to ask detailed questions in a group of 30 people. When you put them in those little groups of five and six and they go around doing their speed dating thing, it's a totally, totally different scenario because they're interacting. How'd I do, Andrew? Is that pretty good? Yeah, I mean, it's very similar to what, you know, in, I, I teach an instructional design course, and we're constantly talking about the affordance of the mediums, the affordances of the mediums. And you're saying, you right. know, you're in a room with 30 people, take advantage of the fact that you're in a room with 30 people. Because the oh, nice. yeah makes a lot of sense. Whereas, you know, right now we're in a broadcasting medium, so we're broadcasting a bit more, you know, you're sharing your ideas and you know there's there could be opportunity for some exchange and dialogue but it's limited in some ways and you know yeah i work for an animation the, the nature of this medium is kind of it's kind of talk and talk and explain yeah so um i'm going to move on to my next point here uh lucy i budgeted budgeted myself to be done about six just for heads up so yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to yeah go as quickly as you want i don't want to overdo it, it, my stay here and I apologize for the wonky uh, hotel Wi-Fi. Now, this is the next thing right here. Can you guys see the image okay? The little thing that looks like a bell curve? This is key. I cannot tell you how critical this is in rolling out um, new initiatives. Um, this is called Moore's Law of Innovation Diffusion. And the idea is basically this. In a gr given group of 100 people, okay, if you take a slice of 100 people and say, Let's all go to White Castle hamburgers or out here um, in and out burger. Everybody's not going to say yes, okay? If you say, let's all go to Starbucks, everybody's not going to say yes. If I gave you all a free trip to Hawaii, but it was on American Airlines, there would be a group of people that would say, can I do it on Southwest instead? This is basically the way that humans react to change. And the things I would like to highlight for you guys here um, are these things right here. About 2.5% of a given public is going to be what's called an innovator. About 13.5% is going to be an early adopter. This is your base for innovation right here. This is why one of my personal rules um, is I don't make everybody do anything. I want you guys to really get your head around that because it feels really good as an administrator to say, school board, 100% of us are blah, blah, blahing. 
The problem is that that's not really going to be true. We'll never really get over about 85%. And the last 15%, we'll be calling the school board telling people I'm an idiot for this idea. So the way I've taken this, which I learned from advertising, is my, my logic is let's take this approximately 16%. And this is where Maloney's 16% rule comes in. I do things like take that 16% and I make them into TOSAs, lead teachers, elevated teachers. I double or triple their PD funding. We have lots of face-to-face -face initiative meetings. We talk about change and initiating change, support their change, get them out on the road presenting. Lucy, I think you can speak to that. Once teachers start presenting, everything changes in their classroom. I'm gonna focus all that energy on that top about 16% of my people. Then what happens is we hit the chasm. And the chasm, right here, and if you look, it's pretty small, I know. But basically, the chasm says, once you've reached 16% adoption on something, you have to change the media strategy. This group of people is going to be very much a self-starter, seeker. They only need a nudge. They only need a little bit. This group right here needs literal instructions. They need, I'm going to try to write literal with my little pen here. Literal. Oh, that's really bad but they need literal and direct support to get the change working. And so what I like to do is the same thing I saw a guy named Dallas Dance do in Baltimore, which is you take 10% of your schools or 10% of your teachers and you basically overfund them with their, they have a commitment then that once they develop their good new program or their good new workflow, that they're going to train the other folks in little batches. And basically it's an exponential thing. If uh, I've got 35 teachers on my campus, if I can get eight or nine of them doing this well and right, whether it's iPad use, Chromebook use, Google use, project-based learning, if I can get them doing it right and then task them with each having two friends the next semester, within a year or two or three, I'm going to flip that whole school. And this little group right here, this is the late mass. They are skeptics and they are inactives. If I have four or five teachers at a school, that don't want to do my adoption, I just leave them alone. In fact, I leave them alone as much as possible. I don't make them do my thing because what they're going to do in most cases is they're going to call the school board. They're going to call the union. They're going to try to pre-grieve it. They're actually going to reach out and grab my non-tenured teachers and go, stay with me, kid. I'll take care of you. And they're going to mess up the whole thing. So I just leave them alone in their pasture. And before I jump off of this slide, I want you guys to think of this. In the Soviet Union, they could kill people that didn't follow the rules. How did that end? Okay. In, in right now in communist China or North Korea, well, North Korea is pretty good at this, but they kill a lot of people. Um, it's, a, it's nearly impossible to make everybody do a monolithic plan. The real way to do this is what I call the way of the hipster. What we've got to do is get people doing this thing, these things because they're cool, because they're passionate about about them because they're exploring their own options. My job is to create a framework that's educationally effective and let them run a little bit crazy in it. I'm going to give you guys one last marketing concept and then uh, we can do some q and I'm hoping you guys will jump in by voice, although I'm seeing a lot of chats right now. Um, have you guys heard of a push or a pull strategy? This is another marketing technique thing and I'm going to just, I'm just going to Google it here and I'm going to go back to my mouse. Uh, and if you just type in push, pull strategy, the Google uh, will point this out too. There's a push strategies and pull strategies. And a lot of people haven't seen this in real life, but it happens to you all the time. I'll give you guys two examples. You're going down the, the uh, cart. Uh, you got your cart in the, shop, in the shopping uh, market there and you're buying some groceries. Have you ever bought shampoo or soap because it says 25% more free? It's not even your favorite brand. It just says 25% more free. And you say, oh, yes, I will. Like maybe you love Crest, but it's two for one this week on Colgate. Guess what you're going to do? The chances of you picking up the Colgate are pretty good. That's called a push strategy. They're basically pushing the product down your throat by price. Do you ever pick the cereal you don't like as much because it says 40% more free? So that's a push strategy. A pull strategy sounds like this. You could drive a Yugo because it would get you home from work and it would get you to work, but you are going to buy a BMW, which is $40,000 more because you deserve it. Um, that one always gets some good laughs from people.
But the idea is that in, adver uh, in, in, um, in education, when we're rolling out new initiatives, we tend to either blackmail people into it, quote, because it's ed code, or just ram it down their throats, which is just really <laughs> not that much fun. It's just not that much fun. And so uh, what we've got to do is look at other ways uh, to share our ideas besides simply ramrodding everything. And you want to develop some subtleties. So you say things like this. Um, when I started the new school that Lucy was talking about, I was starting a, a new high school about 15 miles from a well-established high school with really good sports, with a really good brand, and with really good academics. How am I gonna fill my high school that needs some of their kids? You know how I filled my high school? I did a little uh, push strategy. Our high school starts at 9 a.m. I took all of their accolades, all of their sports, all of their history, nullified it right off the get-go with we start at 9 a.m. Because the kids, <laughs> the kids that go to the other high school have to get on the bus at 6:40 a.m. and they ride the bus for almost an hour. My kids can get up at 8 and be early for school at 9. So that's a pull strategy. Um, push strategy. Uh, sorry, that's a push strategy. Then I also said, oh, by the way, we're going to give all of you MacBooks, and then we're going to give all of you Google Docs back in 2008 when it was not cool to do that. So. That's the way that you do this educationally. Um, like I talked about earlier, uh, I designed projects in my class so that every kid does a good job. Every kid goes home and tells their parents, oh my gosh, I love doing my state report. And the parents, especially the tiger moms, are like, I didn't even know you guys were working on your state reports. And then the kid shows them the state report and they're like, oh my God, that is so much better than when I did state reports. Then those parents go to other parents at church, at the sports clubs, at the barbecues, and they go, Karippo's crazy. Look at all this stuff they're doing. My kids love it. So that's not an educational mindset. Is An educational mindset is my class is rigorous. These kids will work their brains out. They'll hate me all year, but they'll love it at the end. Um, I just don't want to be in that party. So as you guys are starting to look at things like rolling out those new strategies, what you've got to do is break your people into little groups. You've got to get some small wins. You've got to think five Ps. How am I going to attract people to do this? And then you've got to make um, agreements with them. One of my agreements is if you do this my way, you'll work a shorter week and you'll be more effective. Once I tell that to the group, even then the whole group doesn't say, I'll take some, John it's still only that seven or eight percent going, I hear what you're saying, I'd like to try this. Then I coach them up real hard until they're totally getting it and they're winning. And then I take that middle group and I do tours through their classroom that's really fun. And the teachers are like, you know what, I really just don't even do discipline anymore because the kids are so engaged. Like, I can't remember doing detention. I can't remember writing somebody up. And now you've got FOMO and I wanna end with FOMO. FOMO is a big deal. You need to have a classroom environment where people feel left out. And you wanna do that as an educational leader. You want people begging to get into your school because it looks like a party, because it's fun and it's effective. So that's kind of my, that's kind of my wrap up for you guys. Um, and then we can move to some questions. I hope this helps. Yeah. Um, this is stuff I share with a lot of people and they usually really like it. So my question for you is, when you're looking at your faculty and trying to figure out where, like, let's say you're new to a school. Um, I, I think Corey's fairly new to his school. He's been there a couple of years, maybe. Uh, big faculty. It takes a while to get to know them. How do you know where they fit in that bell curve? And, um, you know, I obviously right off the bat, you can probably tell who the 16% the, the, the yeah. are. But, like, some people are kind of sneaky about it. <laughs> so Yeah, they've learned to live under the radar, right? Because, uh, and that's one of my other little sayings is, uh, you want to be less rebel, more ninja, right? A rebel, <laughs> a rebel gets eliminated. A ninja, they're like, there was somebody here? You know, the thing. <laughs> oh, no, I can't hear. That Wi-Fi. I think he got dropped. Oh, right in the middle of the great stuff here. So, Lucy, I can say, though, the cool thing that we have our district is we do have that option that we do give teachers who want the opportunity. So we do a – we'll call it a, a foundation grant. Okay. But the teachers every year can apply for literally no limit, whatever they want, for their classroom. 
and then they're expected to document, explain, and basically sell to others what they brought to their classroom. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. kind of cool that the ones that really want to push ahead have the opportunity. Yeah, I think I, I first saw grants in a friend of mine's district in Oregon, and yeah. they had a symposium at the end of the year or some sort of kind of capstone <laughs> event, and and the teachers presented their work and the results to like the, it, it was it wasn't super formal, but it was a way to kind of wrap everything up. And right. they, did, they did a lot of stuff with iPad Touches. This is a while ago. Um, and then in the current district I'm working with right now, they have an innovation grant, but they haven't, they ha- what's interesting about it is they have not put a lot of bells and whistles attached to it. And they kind of want teachers to, and I think teachers find it frustrating because they want to know what's innovation right. and, and they need more structure. And then like, just like, I don't know if you were at the beginning of, of, of class tonight, but people were asking me questions about the, about the first part of our assignment, which is a little bit open-ended. Right. And, and teachers aren't comfortable with open-ended, right? And, no, you need the stuff. Yeah, you need yeah. the stuff. So this innovation grant, this one district has, has, I don't know how effective it's been because people are, are um, they, they want to know exactly what to do, you know, every single second. So um, it is. Yes, with the, yeah, with our innovation grants, innovation there, everybody needs to know what to do every single second. With our innovation grants, they, yeah. you know, sky's the limit, but they are expected to meet with us as ed techs in any aspect, technology and not, to kind of give them ideas and bounce yeah. ideas off each other. Because oh, you're right, great. they might come with something kind of, it seems like a great idea, but they're just going the wrong direction with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the big scary problems for me right now is that we don't know what we don't know in education. Right. So people are trying to do things like better lectures. <laughs> or that better workbooks. <laughs> or better worksheets. And what right. they really do is they... It's it's not gonna work. It's right. they need a whole different paradigm. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what yeah. So I'm the one that's all over the country, in, like doing the presenting and everything. But mm-hmm. I bring it to the table, and it's nice that they trust me to come to me. So, right. I'm the one that kind of helps. I step in when I need to step you, in. You've done something. John. You've done something right. Can I just finish up with with that, and then you can keep going? Um, yeah, Corey. By the way, John was is his young educator of the year a couple years ago, and he um, seems okay. Yeah, he's okay. And, um, and, and, and so he's, he he's, done, he's done some stuff for, for APD um, as well. So I think, uh, and, and the thing is, is that I think that's part of it. Like if, if the person in your school who's in charge of, of helping people isn't um, cognizant of right. what their role is and how they come off and how they grab people, then you're dead in the water, right? Right, right, right. Well, and then that's where I referenced it earlier with the Rockstar Admin. You have to be the lead educator. You can't be rolling into a classroom with your suit and tie on and going, uh, the kids are being very quiet. That's excellent. That's not going to get the job done. And, and so if, if that lead educator doesn't know, I'll give you guys a couple of snapshots of what I've seen. I visited about uh, 400 classrooms in the last 16 months with Q. We do um, basically classroom reviews for school districts. So this is like eight school districts in California, 400 classrooms. 92% of the time, the kids are not even touching technology, much less doing anything that's 4Cs or related with technology. So the teachers really don't even know what it's supposed to look like. So to them, better classroom is quieter and grades turn in faster. That's all that they're aiming for. So one of the things, I think you'll like this, Corey, and I can take it offline with you. Um, I did a thing called... Uh, a few years ago, we, we decided to make our problem or practice for our instructional rounds four C's. Like, how do we take the four C's? And I like the four C's better than SAMR because it's very relatable. That's I just, uh, SAMR I just presented four C's today. <laughs> okay, good. So let, let, yes. me give you my spin. let me give you my spin. So for me, the four C's is, the beauty of this is first, your teachers are already trained. The standard doesn't change. Oh, right. The activity changes, right? Latin roots, Latin roots. Nouns, <laughs> nouns. Pythagorean theorem, what the kids are doing is what changes. So you don't explain it better. You create an experience where they do more. So this is what I came up with um, in a, like one of my admins on my admin team said, John, I don't want you to train me in creativity. Okay. So when we do this for C things, I don't want a creativity training. (laughs) That's a good point. So here's what we did. I took two assignments and we have throwdowns. So we okay. took, here's a given exi- assignment. And uh, let's, let's imagine this. Um, in California, we have these California missions that the Spaniards, Spaniards did. 
And, and so the Spaniards made these missions all up and down the state. Now these are famous for moms and dads doing the report. That's a fourth grade standard. Mom and dad did the report. You go to Michael's Art Supply and you buy your mission, you assemble it, boom, I did a mission, right? <laughs> so what we do is we show that classic mission project and I put it up on the screen. And what I, all I've done is I've gone on Google and I've done Google Images, uh, mission report rubric, and I take somebody's random rubric and I go, good, mission report. What is the four C's potential? I'm gonna give you 10 points in each category. Okay. Creativity, creativity. It's not a zero, but if I'm buying it at Michael's Art Supply, it might be a two out of 10. Right, it's definitely lower. Communication, oh, by the way, communicating with your parents doesn't count. <laughs> um, create uh, 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 critical thinking, ooh, if I'm buying it at a Michael's Art Supply, again, I might be like a two. Right. And then, uh, you know, so I take the four C's and say, I need you guys to discuss this as a table group give it 10 points in each category, and then come up with a total of 40 points possible. Then we put up a Kahoot survey, and we let the whole room vote on it. Uh -huh. So do you want to know how it skews? It's going to skew really this way. <laughs> right. It's going to be like uh, 12 to 20 points on the Kahoot survey. Not a quiz, but a survey. Right. Then, then I put this up. I put up a three-minute video of a kid who has made a, his mission report in Minecraft. Different the other. And they're doing they're it online, okay. so they're communicating with one another. And, there you and go. the whole room goes, oh shit, this isn't even going to be fair. Because <laughs> now by just changing, not the content, no. the context of what the kids are doing, they're building the Minecraft report at school, they're doing right. stuff their parents can't help them with. It's wildly creative, none of the missions look the same. Each right. kid has a job and a role, they're really talking it through, and at the end they have to make a video where they announce all their parts. Now you go and vote on that in the four C's throwdown. You do the Kahoot again. And now it's like, guess what? It's skewed like this, right? Oh, it's like, good. and so I do about six or seven scenarios like that. And here's, here's my idea. The idea is that we need to raise teachers' palettes. They are living on an AM, PM palette in terms of their lesson design. And they need to think Flemings and food trucks and drivers, uh, <laughs> driver, di uh, di di driver. Yeah, they need to think that way, and they're thinking yeah. so low. They're thinking, "I've got an assignment. I'll grab a box of Kraft macaroni and cheese." They seem to love that. Well, it's because they don't know the difference. So they never it, had homemade macaroni and cheese. So I can send you that slide deck. It's called. So it's that deck. teacher lead. It's that. Is it just? I mean, is it really just one change? Is that truly a building needs, or is it one well, admin that allows for everything, and then one teacher who? It's, it's, well. it's, 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 it's systemic because you need yeah. an administrator who can run a four C's throwdown. Right. The staff to go, holy crap, I'm doing this wrong. Can you help me, boss? That's and then the, the boss part. needs to be out there going, okay, you know how John is sharing Minecraft? Couldn't we do our state report in Minecraft or our galaxy report in Minecraft? And you start going, oh, this is, this is a mindset shift that I don't just go to teachers pay teachers and get a better worksheet. Right. If there was a perfect worksheet, Amazon would be sold out. Right, and they, I mean, they have their new service. But now, now what about this? So let's say you do that throwdown, and then a month later you guys come back together and everyone's like, we all okay. use Minecraft for our project. That's and perfect. the same tool. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Who cares? Because your professional development's easier. We're all gonna be into Minecraft for the next six months. That's you're good. gonna be doing uh, plant cells. You're gonna be doing Minecraft. You're gonna be doing uh, making a calculator. But now PD wise, we're just using a tool. Um, Lucy will like this one. Just making better slides, man. Oh, just yeah. helping the kids make better presentations. Oh. Trust me. I um, <laughs> I've got another one that I do called thick and thin prezos, right? So there's thick presentations and thin presentations. I've stolen this from uh, Gladwell. Okay. Uh, Here's what I'm tired of seeing. I'm tired of seeing one crappy slide with one crappy picture and four bullets. Like that's okay. middle of the Venn diagram and it's horrific. Right. I want to either see one picture, one, one word. That's the thin presentation. The bug, yeah. And the kid owns it. They're like tearing it up. All they need is that one image and they're gone. Well, that's right? Ted style right there. That's what right. Ted does. Ted style or um, the other one is Lawrence Lessig. You know, it's ultra lean, but I right. own the content. I right. own the content. Now, the thick presentation, I think you're going to like this too, because every teacher is already an expert at it. They just don't know to do it. It's like, why did I have to wait to be 44 to know you could put bacon in my macaroni and cheese? That <laughs> took me 44 years of my life for somebody to go, oh, shit, we'll put bacon in it. 
and then six months later, somebody drops in some lobster, and you're like, what else could we put in mac and cheese? We could put Chipotle. Right. The thick presentation, you're going to love this. It's basically just you take a paragraph, and you put that deconstructed paragraph on a slide. I want six facts. I want two citations. I want three pictures. I want a title, a subtitle, everything that a kid would have on a great paragraph, except not writing the paragraph. But deconstructed, I do like that idea. Totally deconstructed. And you can go to human children that are sixth graders and tell them, we're going to do a 12-slide presentation on ancient Rome using this template. And you know what they go? Awesome! If you told them you're going to do a 12-paragraph report on ancient Rome, you know what they would do? <laughs> so I just ran a poll strategy on them. That's pretty good. I like that thick and thin. I do like that one. So I can, I can send you that link as well. Um, but what I'm trying to share with the anecdotes is the mindset. Right. The, the building admin has got to see the potential in that. So when they come into the room, they've got to go, is that a thick or a thin presentation? And the teacher goes, oh, that's, that's thick, but it's not thick enough yet. I'm but I like that vocabulary too, that terminology. Even that will be helpful. Yeah. So trigger words, uh, school-wide things. Another way to boot up your school, um, mm -hmm. and then I'll shut up because now I'm like 12 minutes over. No, no, I like this. And I have good questions for you two coming too. <laughs> another, way, another way to do this is, have you heard of a smart start? No, but I can guess it's some sort of icebreaker. Yeah, for the whole year though. So Ooh. what we do with a smart start, and um, Lucy, if you just Google John Carippo smart start, I got a really ugly Google site. But take this, <laughs> take this, this is how it started. It's a, it's a Trojan horse, dude. It is a Trojan horse. It is straight marketing. So I'm starting a new school. Two weeks before school starts, I have this thought, oh my God, if I don't stop them from starting school the way they normally do, they're just going to recreate their, all their crappy schools at my high school. You the same path, so I yeah. decided to interdict that process. How do I interdict that process? Also, very few of our teachers had ever been one-to-one, -one, so they were needy. So I invoked a push and a pull strategy. Hey, you guys, John's going to do your lesson plans for the whole first week. Ergo, the right. birth of Smart Start. So what we did was we made little packages, like 20-minute lessons okay. for the teachers to run. It was like nine or ten slides. And we were teaching the teachers how to lesson design better. And if you want to look up one, I'll give you one of my scenarios. Is so kind of like an advisory period or more like that. Exactly. Yeah. But I'm running the whole first three days of school like advisory to build right. and de-silo my kids. Kids bully each other because they've never met each other. I sit right. in the front, sit in the back. I don't know your name. You like the Raiders. I hate. I like the Raiders, but we don't know it. So I had like three circles of success going on here. One was better lesson design for my teachers and instituting our, our verbiage. The other one was better experience for kids. Because let's be honest, the first three days of school are when we wreck the year. Right? Oh, yeah. By you, the, by the, the ninth or the tenth day, the kids are all like, I don't want to go back. So... What we decided was we're going to make these mini lessons for the first three or four days of school. And one of them is called the worst presentation ever. So stay with me. <laughs> okay. How do we normally teach PowerPoint? Welcome to PowerPoint. This is a seven-week course. You will learn all the tabs and drop downs. We will read the tutorial. And you will hate me by Halloween, right? So this is how the worst presentation goes. I found a, a stand-up comedian that does a thing called uh, Death by PowerPoint. It's a oh, yeah. video. Oh yeah, have I've you seen, seen that one. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. And if you remember the video, he has like eight very discreet fail points. Too many words, bad color scheme, too many animations. So I have my kids get out pencil and paper. I show them the video. Okay, explain to yourself what just happened. What was the error and number it. So we all agree. Bad color scheme is number three. Right. Uh, too many animations is number four. And the kids are making paper slides as he goes. Okay. At the end, I say, open up your Google Slides. I need you to break five of the rules, one rule per slide, on something you like or dislike. I work with teenagers, so you have to say like or dislike, because if you say something you like, they'll all say, I don't like anything. So I give them the dislike. <laughs> and if you start with dislike, you know what they'll say? You're mean. So I say <laughs> like or dislike. That's your problem. Your problem. Push-pull strategy. So they make about five or six slides, and they break exactly one rule per slide. This is happening school-wide, Corey. This is happening school-wide. Why? Because as an administrator, I'm popping into classrooms seeing how the hell they're executing this simple right. plan. Because there are people that will not get this right, and they're going to get love. 
A lot of love. <laughs> we're going to hug it out. Because that's how I do this. We're going to hug it out. <laughs> so I have the kids make the five slides the first period. Then they come back the next day. Their slides are made. And I go, now you're going to present them. But what's the reaction from the kids? Uh, uh, right? Okay. No, you don't get time to practice. And by the way, you're going to present somebody else's slides at the end of Ooh, okay. I'm digging that. <laughs> now they're laughing their heads off. Dude, they're laughing their heads off. Now the kids in the audience are giving that kid a grade, but uh, it's just style points. Right. And then making sure that the rule is being properly broken on each slide. Do you know what the rest of my year looks like after two periods of that? Dude, it is a parte all year long. Because I got kids doing this during presentations. Dude, that's a lot of bullets. Yeah, they're calling each other out then. Yeah, they're going to take ownership. Yeah. yeah. And, and I can't tell you the brain development aspects of that, but there's something that is completely um, human teenagers cannot resist that. And you build, you build culture, you build friendship. Now, your job as a building administrator is to go back and go, how do we make your class feel like that every day, dude? How do we do that every day? Right. And there's some, some, some simple ways. You just established that the worst presentation is something that we do after Christmas break. When we come back from Christmas break, boom, worst presentation ever. And you know what the kids will say? We've already done this. And I'm going to go, good. You should rock it, dude. I'm going to cut your work time in half. Right. And everyone will still get an A because we're going for mastery. And now you've got this whole culture thing going. So I got a whole bunch of packages on that web page. Do you... Have you ever run those with the staff? Run those lessons with the staff? Oh, yeah, yeah. I run them with adults all the time. It's that just would, a slide with human people. slideshow one would be hilarious with staff. Yeah, yeah just Google the worst presentation oh. ever. Um, uh, uh, what's her name? Cool Cat Teacher did a really nice little 10-minute interview with me on, on the take on that. Okay. But I've got a bunch of packages like that. Iron Chef is another one. That's what I was, thinking. I was thinking. I was thinking EdTech Chef. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. okay, so here's how I do it. Here's how I do it. I do a little different twist. There are several variations of this. So you remember the jigsaw lesson plan? How yep. does the jigsaw lesson plan go? I'm reading chapter two, paragraph seven. You're reading paragraph eight or whatever it is. <laughs> and then we'll teach it at the end of the day, yeah. Right, so here's the first rule, no direct instruction. Okay. I just drop them in the pool. And we start off with something fun like new kids on the block. There's a Wikipedia article on new kids on the block. You, history, you, bio, you, top hits, you, um, long term. We're there now, yeah. <laughs> and doing awards. Yeah. So each kid in a group of about five does one thing from Wikipedia. They get 10 minutes to build one slide. Okay. Each slide will have two pictures and four what I call fact bullets. Please do not copy over from Wikipedia. I'll be able to tell. You need to rewrite it in a short. Get rid of the, yeah, get rid of the fluff words. Yeah. Right. So in our, in our team, what would happen was be Lucy would get my template. All the instructions were in the template. Lucy would get it as a team leader, distribute it to her team. How many minutes do kids get to build the slides? 10, yeah. And then instantly they present right where they're at. On the fly right there. Now I'll do that about three cycles with the kids. I'll do the history of the Big Mac. I'll do <laughs> new kids on the block. I'll do Bon Jovi or something like that. And then we ease right into nouns or compound sentences or types of triangles. But the key here is in 10 minutes, they have been working and I've been walking around drinking my coffee going, good job, you guys. I'm not right. doing direct instruction. And then they hear the same lecture five or six times because in most classes, you have around 35 kids. Oops, right. Hard clock, two minutes, no practice. Go up, do it, sit down. Next group, up, do it, sit down. And then I play the role of Ryan Seacrest. My job is to make sure the facts are real. I had one group one time say the Greeks invented ancient, uh, the ancient Greeks invented sandals. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. quippa has got a $20 bill here for the person that can find that on the internet. You got three minutes. <laughs> they're like, I can't find it. And I go, hmm, what do you think about that? <laughs> it's really not real. So my job is just to moderate. I don't direct instruct anymore. Can and I? There's, can, yeah, go ahead. What about, uh, I'm thinking about some of our elementary teachers in the room. Uh, how would you adapt this for younger students? I've seen this as young as second grade, Lucy. Oh, awesome. Okay. And you know what they use? It, I they think use they could Wikipedia. do it easily. They use simple Wikipedia and more pictures. Okay. Or okay. they allow them to copy paste. Hey, they're in third sure. grade. It's fine. Okay. Can you find the fact and put the fact in your slide? Ed, you win. We'll worry about the writing part later, right? 
And then uh, there's variations. You can have, uh, if Corey, if you got one group that thinks they're so cool, good. Uh, the team that gets the top score this week is going to make the quiz is that's the quiz for next week. Give them responsibility. Give them like real yeah. ownership. Yeah. yeah. But you're keeping it popping. Like, right. You know, Mix if you got a group never the same. so good, if you got a, a group that's so yeah. good, that they're killing it. You're like, you, you guys are the judges this week. You're giving the grading. The whole class is like, oh, and I go, like, dude, you can pay them Twinkies at recess. Impress them. <laughs> Get them going. But the key is it's a modern flow in the classroom. It's give and take. It's exciting. I had a couple of teachers at, our, at a, my last school that actually installed disco balls for the work period because they wanted to be as chaotic as possible during Iron Chef. I had okay. another teacher, that he got in trouble with his neighboring teachers because he would blast ACDC while the kids were working. It's fun, dude. It's fun. And here's the best part. What's my lesson planning time? I would like you to find one academic content area that's not currently at Wikipedia. Good luck with right. that. Good luck with that. <laughs> so as a leader now, guess what we also don't need? We don't need textbooks. That's just a textbook idea, yeah. Because I, I have a workflow. Right. I have a workflow, and I have materials. No, what I do I need a textbook for? Oh, I back it. And then uh, if you're in an English class and you fold in something like Common Lit for some of the more structured activities, and you do some quizzes for your Latin roots and things like that, you're done, man. You're done. Right. So that's why I'm, I can be 70 years old and look this fresh. I didn't work in the classroom like <laughs> people. I didn't work like you people in the classroom. You work too much. So I'm going to uh, wrap up here because Andrew, the poor guy, has, this is his third webinar today. He's, he's after you. And he's, <laughs> and he's on the East Coast. And he has a young kid at home. And um, so I want to make sure he gets some time in here. I think he's enjoying this. But um, so if you guys want to know more about John and his work and, and follow up on some of these ideas, I posted some links into the chat and I'll save the chat. You can, you can save the chat um, document somehow. I did it last week. Um, so make sure I'll, I'll, I'll save it and I'll post it somewhere. Um, but make sure that you bookmark those links and that sort of thing to look at. Also uh, at the Q conference, which starts Thursday, uh, and I don't know if you're in any of the live sessions. I haven't looked at it really closely, John. But Tip, you're not, are nah. you, you're not presenting this. I'm kind of staying off the radar this year. I'm, I'm, I'm letting other people shine. Oh. Anyway, look at the recordings I posted because um, – so, so for Q, I do their social media from afar, typically. And so I, for the past two years, I've watched their conference and watched John present from my, the comfort of my own home. And, and I'm actually going there this week, which will be a little bit different. And we're stoked to have you out here. Yeah, I'm excited too. I mean, the energy there is amazing. But you guys can take advantage of Q by going to q.org slash live. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a lot of amazing presentations from, you know, this uh, California it, in general. I just, I think they blow everybody's socks off. Sorry, Illinois. But um, there's a lot of good stuff going on. So make sure that you take a look at it and follow John. We tried to get a rock star camp going here last year. Maybe that will happen. Yeah, again. that was uh, my question, John. Can we get some more Midwest, mid, uh, Midwest love? Yeah, we're definitely open to that. And I think uh, you guys had a either. We, you guys had a Michigan one a while ago, right? Or tried yeah, we, a Michigan we did, one? We did two Michigans and they went great. We've done a couple Boston's and they've gone really well. My problem is I got three hundred and twenty thousand teachers in California, and I'm having trouble keeping them happy and taking it on the road. Right. But I'm gonna. Tease something for you guys right now. We're looking at a rock star admin global edition possibly next spring in okay. Vegas. Oh, Vegas. I can It'll be that. open to everybody. And we're going to do stuff like what I was talking about. We're going to do lesson design for admins. Okay. How to run your PD in-house for admins. Because what I see at a lot of the admin training is you're going to get a Michael Fullan Marzano type of character. And I love them. They're great. Mm -hmm. I don't need ideas. I need techniques. I got plenty of ideas. Most admins don't need an idea. They need a technique. And right. they leave the sessions going, that's a good idea. But I already had 200 ideas. How do I start a blog? That's what I really need. Or how do I, you know, how do I run a Kahoot? I have no idea. And we, they need the strategies. Yeah. Yeah. And we run our sessions and they're like, you'll like this one too. I'll give you one last free one and then I'll get out of here. Um, we do EduFlight model. Have you heard of EduFlight Club? Um, no. That's yeah, because no. the first rule is we don't talk about EduFlight <laughs> Um, so what you'll see a lot of times in education is this is better. This is better. I like this. I like this. And then we kind of passive aggressively just beat each other up at lunch. 
Um, right. So what we've done is started doing edu fights. So let's say here's an example. We 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 uh, set up a, a PD for 45 minutes. One group is going to get Socrative, one group is going to get Kahoot, and one group is going to get Quizzes. Okay. I'm not going to train you. You people are not idiots. There's no Facebook training. You figure it out. I'm giving you guys 15 minutes to build a quiz for the other two teams. And then we're going to have a quiz off. And we're going to do some real data right now. And then you're going to get about 10 minutes to build a couple slides about three things you like and don't like about your respective product. Edu Fight Club. So a different take on Jigsaw, but like more competitive. Yeah, and fun competitive because yeah, competitive, end, I, yeah. I know that all three of those products are fine. What right. I try to do is get them in their heads. To sell it. Yeah. So, so Corey is, the, is one of the tech coordinators at the high school I went to, John. Which is a rock, it's an amazing. If you've ever seen ordinary people, it's a school in the front of ordinary people, and um, it would be awesome to get a rock star camp going there. I mean, Corey, you should you should talk to like Judy and see if you could guys could get something going cross district or something. Oh yeah, yeah. and we only need a hundred people to show up. Really, like seventy to make it work. We're built to be small. They're micro conferences, and we love going on the road. And we've got Lucy, and then we can fold you in. And it's it's uh, I think it's one ninety nine for two days. So it's really cheap and we've been throwing in a t-shirt. <laughs> Is it tribal yeah. now? Come on. <laughs> uh, we could. We could. <laughs> all right. All right, Chad. So do you have Cal you okay. have, you have Q chat tonight too? I gotta bounce because I got Q chat at seven and if I don't leave now I won't get dinner. Okay. All right. I'll join Q Q, Q Q I'll do both. I can't even talk Q chat <laughs> uh, okay. while while I'm moderating Free this. John, you're on awesome. lifetime tech support. Yeah. Drop it drop me a line on Twitter and I'll okay. Back you guys up. Okay. See you tomorrow. So. See you tomorrow afternoon. All right. Bye bye. Done. Safe travel. Okay. Thanks. All right, guys. That was fun. I love that. <laughs> so many, so many great ideas. Is it? Isn't he a hoot? Oh, I enjoy. Uh, I've, yeah, I've seen him a few times. Yeah, he's, he's really, he's really a treat. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Andrew. And Andrew, we don't have to spend like the whole hour at all, obviously. Um, but my, you guys, this is my friend Andrew, who I just adore, and I just spent um, several days with him in, in uh, South by Southwest, and he's been a classroom teacher. He was a first grade teacher. He was a tech coach, um, and now he works for Brain Pop, and he's really developed their whole um, Brain Pop educator program and done all sorts of cool things, and he's one of the most thoughtful educators I know. Um, so I'm really happy to bring him to you tonight as well. He's really, it's, this is a really kind of a special double edition of our webinars. So Andrew, take it away. Thanks, Lucy. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yes, you can hear. All right, great. Um, cool. So fun to listen to John. And it's actually a great entry point because he ended with saying, all right, we do Edu Fight Club and we look at, you know, Kahoot, Socrative, and, um, you know, quizzes or Quizlet or something. And everyone's got to go and make their own quiz and we fight it out. And my big job at Brain Pop is to let people know that we have our own quiz making tool too. <laughs> no one knows this stuff. So there's tons of stuff on Brain Pop that no one really knows much about. And so um, when I came there about six years ago, um, after having been, um, like Lucy was said, teaching the classroom and whatnot, I, um, my job was to raise awareness that Brain Pop was more than a movie and a quiz, because that's what everyone seems to know. So in the room, I see one person, uh, most, okay, mostly Brain Pop Junior, someone else loves Brain Pop. Has anyone not heard of Brain Pop? You can tell us if you haven't, and then I can quickly explain to you uh, shortly what it is, and then uh, kind of take it from there. Um, has anyone not heard about it? And I know this is kind of breaking John's point that said, oh, you don't ask a group of people what they, any questions because they don't like to say it. But Anthony, I totally appreciate um, <laughs> you being honest with that and saying that uh, you've never heard of Brain Pop. Um, I'll, sh I'll just share my screen and I've got a few slides just about what we do with professional learning. Um, and I think what will be nice is you'll hear a lot of the stuff that John was talking about, um, push-pull, um, you know, getting empowering teachers, demonstrating how to actually use the product rather than talking about the product, all that kind of stuff um, in what we do. But I'm going to share, I'm, let me share my screen. Um, uh, Click this, you got, the, you got it, there it is. All right. Um, so you're seeing the, the slide deck, yeah? Is that correct? Okay. Yep, we're good. Um, 
So for those of you who don't know about BrainPop, really quickly, I will just open a link in a new tab. BrainPop um, is a company that's been around for about almost 20 years. Um, it's primarily known for making short anim visual explanations, animations that explain things to kids. Um, it's broken down by subject area. Um, and so, for example, today is Pi, and so that's our featured movie and our featured topic. And if I click onto Pi um, here in the center, it's going to bring me to a topic page that shows um, a video right here um, about the concept of Pi. Um, and then you can see there's the little tile as well. There's a quiz, there's a make a map, there's a make a movie, there's FYI, there's activities. We also have tons of games. and um, my job at BrainPop is to help teachers think about how to use these resources most effectively. Um, movies have a very specific uh, structure, um, and the, there's kind of many, many learning pathways that a student or teacher could take through BrainPop. Um, there's, there's no really right way to use it. There's just a lot of ways. And it's an island. It's a subscription service that you, uh, a school would pay for. Everyone logs in and um, recently everyone logs in with their own username and password and uh, they can submit, students can submit the work that they do on BrainPop to their teachers, which involves some consumption like watching movies or reading things that are called the FYIs and some production such as making concept maps or producing movies or filling in digital worksheets or doing stuff like that. So. Um, that's a very, very broad overview of what BrainPop is. Right now we're looking at the page for Pi, but there's 800 topics on BrainPop, or over 800 in all the different subject areas. Um, and there's about 200 games, and there's about, uh, there's topics for BrainPop Junior, which is a K-2 product. Um, and so um, my job there is I'm responsible so this is me, I'm Andrew. Um, my, my title is VP of Professional Learning. Um, and my, jo my, my job is to be responsible for helping people use the product more effectively. Um, so, and primarily I'm, I'm targeting teachers because it's a school product that um, is primarily sold to schools. It's about 25 to 30% of the schools in the US. We're starting to have a digital or uh, um, international presence as well. Um, and uh, I do it through three ways. Um, there's a website that's called Brain Pop Educators. So, for example, if I'm here on the Brain Pop page and I scroll down and I click on Lesson Ideas, this is going to open the Brain Pop Educators page. It only appears when I'm logged in as a teacher. Um, and it says, All right, here's a pie, um, the description of the movie, here's a lesson plan, here are some quizzes that people have recently made around the concept of pie. Um, here are some related games that are um, about Pi. Um, here are some tips. So my job is to curate and create these pages. This is a dynamic website. So no matter what my entry point is, be it Pi, be it Abraham Lincoln, be it cells, be it anything, it will automatically create, um, it'll, it, will, it will only serve up content that's related to that entry point. So this is a lesson ideas for Pi. But like I said, if I go to lesson ideas for cells, I'm just changing the URL here. You're going to see it's going to load up lesson plans for cells and quizzes about cells and printables about cells and related videos about cells and games about cells. So there's um, roughly 1,500 of these kinds of pages. And so we're trying to, if, a t if and when a teacher is teaching a certain topic area, we want to give them support content um, based around that content. Um, so that's the BrainPop Educators site. Um, I also run a certification program, which um, we started about three years ago, to, um, to help sort of that 16% that John was talking about, those early adopters, the people that um, want to be doing things more interesting, more, uh, have, have a bit more self-initiative. Um, they can apply to become certified, and it's, a, um, it's not a... Uh, it's an, it's an application-based uh, certification process, um, which is very hands-on in which, in which we really try to model best um, practices for using BrainPop. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And we also now sell professional development as well, kind of like John was talking about. He'll take the Q Rockstar event 
you know, on the road for $199 a day, we will take the Brain Pop show on the road to various um, schools or, or districts if they want to learn more about it, uh, they can pay us and we'll come. Um, the certification is free, and I'll tell you about how we administer that for free, but the paid PD is paid because we're going to a specific, um, a specific uh, district or, or school. Um, so I'm just, I just kind of told you about Brain Pop Educators. Um, let me talk a little bit about certification because I'm going to try to be quick here. So um, when Brain Pop began uh, moving from a single login and only movies and quizzes to um, individual logins and opportunities for students to produce things like concept maps and movies, um, we found that we had a brand identity issue because everyone in these schools, they were using the same username and password. They were just using Brain Pop for movies. And the movies were good. They explain and demystify stuff in great ways. Um, like I was sharing when John got cut off earlier, we're, we're primarily an animation company. And animation is a really great um, media format for illustrating complex concepts in, in um, clever ways. Um, so you can illustrate stuff in animation, but it's also character driven. We have two characters and there's this robot that always beeps and people seem to like him. Um, so you kind of develop a relationship with those, with the characters as well. And if you look at most studies about um, children and, and animation or cartoons and TV shows in general, it's about, they, they actually think that sometimes the characters are their friends, especially really young kids. So there is this development of a relationship with the characters in our, um, in our content. But we, people only thought about Brain Pop as movies, and now we had all these other things. So our job was to begin certifying and creating really high touch relationships with groups of teachers to um, have them recognize and proselytize within uh, their, their communities um, you know, the, the value of Brain Pop, because many people purchase it and very few people use it through its potential. Um, so we call them CBEs, and you'll see our kind of goals for the certification um, group, similar to what, what, uh, what Lucy and I were doing as Apple Distinguished Educators, because um, ADE program is one way I know Lucy. Um, and Apple always said, you know, you've got to advocate for us, be our ambassadors, um, and, and give us advice. And that's similar to what we're hopeful with these certified educators. So they'll advocate for best practices and use of brain pop, they'll act as ambassadors you know, on the road, um, they'll advise us on features, um, and they'll build awareness in their communities. So how does that happen? Well, it starts with a, a class. And we will go to um, conferences, or we have an online course as well. And it's a three or six hour um, in-person class where we introduce all the features that people don't know about. And so we don't stand up there and say, oh, there's concept mapping, oh, there's movie making. We start the class with a quiz in which we introduce the new features one by one um, and everyone takes it and logs in as an individual and then submits it. And I'm gonna show you what um, the summary of that quiz would look like. So say everyone had taken the, class, the quiz, it's a do now. This, this is a, you walk in and we don't even say, hey, I'm Andrew from Brain Pop. We say, open up your, you know, your, your little bifold pamphlet that we give you and follow the directions on page one. They create a demo account and they fill in. And so we learn immediately, what grades do you work with? And I can see that of the group that I'm showing right now, 40% were K3. Um, how, how do you log into Brain Pop, Brain Pop Junior or Brain Pop ESL? So I see 50% of the people or 47% has the same username and password. Um, and a few people have the individual. So I'm introducing the fact that you can log in with an individual username and password through having people engage with a quiz question about it rather than me explaining it to them. Because the last thing they need is more explanation. Um, we say there's a learning game portal. Did you know about it? Okay, 30%, 7% have never heard of it. Um, 35 have heard of it. Very few have used it. Um, you know, Brain Pop, Brain Pop has a tool called Make a Map, which allows you to make concept maps. All right. So as I'm going through these questions, not only are we re, um, reaffirming what people engaged with when they took the quiz, because they took this quiz where they're asked these questions, and now we're reviewing it as a group, we're seeing the knowledge of the group. Um, we're, so that's informing me as a teacher um, to say, all right, so 40% you know, of the people have heard of this tool, but they haven't used it. So definitely we got to research that or go into it today. 
Um, as I keep going, there's more and more questions. We have a quiz mixer tool that allows you to create your own quizzes, which is of course what I've just done. I created a quiz and provided it to them. So look, you know, 39 and 44 is 73% uh, of the people had either never heard of it or heard of it, but never tried it. Well, now they've all experienced something produced with it. Um, we have primary sources. Um, we work on, on, uh, on iOS devices without using an app. Um, we provide support materials. What are you most interested in exploring? So the nice thing about this is we can say, all right, 47% really wanted to explore the movie maker. Well, fortunately, we're going to explore all of them today. So even though we'll spend maybe some more time on the make a movie tool, we'll explore everything. And then the last two questions are open-ended. One is, why did you come to today's Brain Pop session? And the intent of asking that of everyone is for them to uh, create an intention because, uh, you know, there's lots of research that says if there's intent behind learning, then uh, you're more likely to focus on what that intent is as you are learning. Um, so, of course, I don't see a pie chart here because it's an open-ended question, um, but I can open up a student's score by clicking that and I can see all their answers and scroll down to the bottom and see, why did you come? Well, to explore new features and learn about and embark on the certified Rain Pop educator process. So I could say, all right, you get a point for that. And I can say, great, you're in the right place. And what I'm doing here is I'm demonstrating to the group that you can evaluate students' work. You can give them feedback on specific questions. Um, and then the last question is starting today's session with a quiz full of poll questions is useful because, um, and this teacher says, to find out the experience level of participants and better individualized instruction. So that's one of many reasons that it was useful to start with a quiz. But then we always say, turn and talk with your neighbor. What are other reasons that was useful to begin with a quiz? And they say, oh, you know, this is a formative assessment because now you can individualize and differentiate instruction based on the, the uh, data that you uh, got from it. Um, they say, oh, it allowed me to let go of the session I was just in because I was still thinking about Quizlet because I was in a Quizlet session. And now I've thought about all this new brain pop stuff because you engaged me in a question about it rather than just told me and I was spacing out and working on my uh, email or something. Um, so there's a lot of reasons that it's useful to start with a quiz. And by modeling this immediately in the beginning of the class for certification, we're establishing the expectation that they're going to be engaged and that they're going to um, experience modeled behaviors in the class itself. Um, so this is how we introduce the, um, the quiz making and how you use quizzes in non-traditional ways, because most people think, oh, quiz is how you evaluate knowledge about a certain thing. Yeah, well, that's one way of using it, but this is another way, so we're modeling it. Um, and then as we go on to introduce the different, um, part, the different tools of the actual meat and potatoes of the, of the workshop, um, it's very hands-on. We don't say this, you know, it's not a I do, you do, we do. It's a, I'm going to give you an assignment and go figure it out. Very similar to what John says about the um, Edu uh, Fight Club. Like, I'm not going to say this is how you use our make a map tool. This is how you make a concept map. But we are going to talk about concept mapping as a learning strategy. And then you're going to um, experiment and play with our tool. And you're not going to take that deep a dive because this is the introduction. This is not, the, you're not certified at the end of this three hour class. This is where we're introducing um, teaching strategies and we're introducing you to the new tools. But after that is when you have to become, is when you have to uh, follow through on certification. I'll talk to you in a sec about what that requires. Um, I'm just going to look at the, the chat because it's closed right now. I want to make sure if, um, yeah. is anyone asking? I, I'm, just questions? Mad, I'm just madly taking notes. So, so I think that this is, to me, it's like, I think teachers need practice, like John was saying, in, um, in strategies, not in ideas. And right, and this, exactly. And so this is the, we're, we're, we're bridging the theory and into the practice. So there's a very meta layer to this entire workshop where we're like, you just took a quiz and we got data about you, but why, why did we do that? And then we're gonna watch a movie about concept mapping as a learning strategy, but why did we do that? And how did I show the movie? We didn't just watch it in, from beginning to end. We paused, we had discussions, because that's active. I'm, I'm, I'm modeling to you active viewing strategies. And so, next level is reactive movie, uh, video, viewing strategies. Um, 
So one of the questions they should be asking as they design these final projects, you know, how are, how are we doing that? How are we modeling the process? How are we yeah. modeling the good pedagogy? Right. I, th I think, and I think this is where in general, I don't think U.S. teachers in general are super strong with their pedagogy. I, I just don't think that we've had enough training experience and coaching for the most part in a lot of places. I, I know my... Yeah, it's, it hasn't been modeled to us yeah. through most of yeah. our educations. You know, you didn't see, you know, if, if we had good math teachers growing up who were modeling good pedagog pedagogy risk taking, we wouldn't have 70% of the you know, U.S. population saying I'm bad at math or like having this anger towards math. You know, it's primarily because they had scary experiences growing up with it. Yeah. Um, so, 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 I, so I was making notes about that and then okay. assessing their background knowledge. I thought that was really smart. Like, like I, I think the trick is like figuring out where do you, how do you have time to look at that while you're leading a professional development session? Um, so that was, that was another thing that, that, that struck me. My question was, when you look at that, so let's say you're doing like a workshop at ISTE like you do, or yeah. it's some conference and you do that, you do that quiz with them. And then you just, what do you do? Do you just briefly look at it to kind of see where they're coming from? And then do you change the way that you're doing the workshop based on their responses? We, so we do exactly what I just did with you in a much slower way. I'm cruising because I've got 12 minutes. Um, but uh, we'll take the quiz and then we'll review it as a, as a class. Because the value of reviewing it as the whole class is to say, look, you can do this with your students too. Okay. That's because I'm not part. evaluating you. I don't care what your answers are. But we're okay. gathering data through this process. And that data is going to inform what we do today. Okay. Um, so okay. That's, that's a really important piece. Okay. Um, so Matthew is asking, yeah, I, I, so Matthew, I think the takeaway here is not necessarily brain pop itself, but right. it's the idea of like how you're structuring the, the PD session to get teachers to be more thoughtful. But maybe Matthew, are you, Matthew, are you asking, is, is there anything in brain pop itself, the product applicable to high school students? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, yes. there, okay. there, there certainly is. There's tons of content in there. But I think I'm, I'm focusing much more on what uh, Lucy's talking about, which is the means by which I'm leading training and professional development is through modeling practice. And so, like, it doesn't even matter what tool I'm showing or whatnot. Mm -hmm. By starting a workshop with a quiz or an engaging act, you know, it's almost a poll more than it is a quiz, you're you're helping people let go of what they were thinking about before. You're immediately engaging them with what they're, um, what's going to, what, what's coming for the next two or three hours or whatever. You're, um, you're, you're setting the expectation of engagement. I can't overstress that. Yeah. Oh. Because if you are, if you're setting the expectation that people are going to sit back and listen to you all day or space out because they're bored, they do. I usually say, folks, all right, you took your quiz, you submitted it. Uh, laptops at 45 and I model with my hands 45 degrees and I say if 45 is too open and you're still looking at it, put it at 33 and I say if 33 is too much close your laptop I need your attention up here now I'm trying to model that's what I did with my first graders you know it's and now it's, I was okay. my iPad please close it and I'm just gonna say look you're, we're gonna be working plenty today but for the next 10 minutes I need your attention that's, a, that's, that's, that's awesome be, you know. so here's so, so, um, so just to follow up on Matthew's, what um, Matthew's yeah. thing. Um, so Matthew, if you, the Brain Pop videos are awesome. They're, they're cute, they're funny, they're informative. They're uh, appealing to anyone of any age to learn about a particular topic. So uh, do I see a lot I also, of let, yeah. me, let me keep, let me just take that and run because we are, the, the value is certainly the videos are useful and there's 10th grade chemistry and 9th grade bio and certainly stuff, particularly useful for remediation if they're struggling with math stuff, but there's plenty of that content there. But what I'm going to show you now is that there's tons of content as well, or there's tons of production tools there as well, which is absolute, absolutely useful for, um, for upper, upper grades. So um, for example, and this, I, I kind of, I'll continue with where I was in the presentation. We kind of paused for a bit of a reflection, but um, what I was saying is that there's a classroom. That's where we model the quiz taking and we model, introducing tools. Um, we also do an online course. 
but the value of both is not in the immediate moment where you're in the classroom with us, but it's in the follow-up. And we expect people to submit five submissions over the course of a month um, that will demonstrate to us competency using our tools. So one tool, we have a concept mapping tool. This is definitely applicable to um, people of all ages, um, definitely high schoolers. Um, we have to create a concept map. Um, this is a tool that we have. I'll, I'll bring it up here. Um, sorry, let me just go back. If, um, if I'm on this, uh, I want to go to the uh, page about Pi. Hold on. Here I am on the BrainPop page about Pi. If I click the Make a Map button, I move from the movie that explains what Pi is to an entirely different interface. This is now a tool where I can construct a concept map. Has anyone used um, concept mapping tools like Inspiration or Kidspiration or Poplet or MindMeister. These are all different concept mapping tools. And um, the, actually the guy that designed BrainPop's Make a Map tool came from um, Inspiration. He was a, um, he was a uh, engineer there. So I can use a template, I can create new, I'm just gonna create new. So right now I've got an open canvas. And um, I, I can ask my question, which is, what is the significance of pi? That's, that's gonna be my guiding question for this map. And I'll put it in here too, just write in pi. And now as I can watch the movie up in the left corner here, and as it plays and I get to a moment. So what is pi? It's just a letter from the Greek alphabet. I can, you just hit the snapshot icon and it takes that moment of the movie um, and puts it onto my canvas. And now, you know, I can fast forward to other moments I bet you've used and put them on my canvas as well. And what's cool is if I click the play button, it's gonna go back to the moment of the movie where um, that was mentioned. So what is pi? It's just a letter from the Greek alphabet. You um, so, and I can bring in images. Um, I can bring in keywords. I love this. If I bring in the keywords like, uh, let's say, irrational number, see it has a play button on it. And so if I click back here on the play button. They write the actual number. Pi is an irrational number. That means it can be written only as a decimal, not a... So it goes directly to that moment of the movie where that keyword is used in context. So what, what we're seeing here with the concept mapping tool is it's different from a traditional one like Inspiration or Kidspiration or Poplet, which is blank. We give you the content here. I could also add movies if I wanted to. I could add a movie about... Uh, these are This is every movie, but if I wanted to add one about... Um, like ge uh, geometry, I could load that movie if we can bring images in here. We're providing all the content and then that allows the students to focus more attention on connections. And that's what all the cog side people say is important. It's not about the, the nodes, these things are called nodes, it's about the connections between the nodes. Um, so this is a kind of tool that's absolutely relevant and useful in a high school setting. Um, and it's available with all the Brain Pop content, all the Brain Pop Junior content. So how do I assure that my, um, the, the people who are going to be certified understand that? Well, we, have, we, we now actually have five requirements. This is an old slide. The first requirement is to create a concept map using that tool. But in that tool, instead of saying what is pi, they have to deconstruct a Brain Pop, moment, a Brain Pop movie into its component parts. So all Brain Pop movies have demystifying visuals. All of them have times when the little robot is beeping, but it has meaning. You have to infer. They all have humor. They all have pause points, moments where you would pause if you were showing it to your students and ask for, um, you start a discussion or do something. Um, there's additional features that have value. So their job on the concept map is to deconstruct a brain pop topic video and topic page. So simultaneously, I see their competency using the tool and I see that they've gone deeply into the movie to recognize the value of them. And they're not gonna pass 
this requirement unless they submit something that has all those moments on it. And it makes it's topic agnostic. They can choose any topic they want, because, and which is useful because most PD people want to say, I want to know that when I leave this workshop that I can do something on Monday, you know, with, the, with what I learned. So um, this is a kind of requirement that, again, it's topic, topic agnostic. So we're not saying you have to do it about this, that, or the other. You just have to do it in this certain structure. And that tell us, tells us you understand it. And it allows you to probably go on Monday and teach it better because you've looked more deeply at Brain Pop in that video than you might have otherwise. So that's the first requirement. Requirement number two is to take snap thoughts. This is a tool where you can play um, one of our learning games. We have 150 learning games. And at any moment in the game, you can take a snapshot, just like we did with the movie, and you can write a reflection. So this is a game um, called uh, Lawcraft, I think. And this person who, uh, the example here, they said is the head of the firm, I must click on an attorney and send her to trial immediately, I'll after listen. So she wrote a little bit um, about this moment of the game and then I wrote back in orange, I like the idea of using snapshots at the moment of identifying valid cases. You can also snap a pic and do the writing later. So point being here, the teachers are demonstrating that they understand there's a tool that exists on our games where they can, students can take pictures and write reflections. And this is a very different way of using games and learning. Games and learning, a lot of the rhetoric is around, oh, you know, quantitative data, it'll feedback, and you know, then you can know exactly what to do with the student next because of the value score they got. Well, this actually is a moment that requires you to step back and reflect on your gameplay, which is a different kind of way. It's qualitative, it's not auto-graded, um, but it can provide you with insight into what a student was thinking at a moment in the game that they found important. So teachers have to submit those. They then have to take, a, we call it a scavenger hunt, you know, 20 years ago with Bernie Dodge, we would have called it a uh, web quest. And they have to basically have to go through the Brain Pop Educator website to, I think, I think 17 or 18 different locations and learn about all the support resources that we have. So if you want to lead a training in your school, we have a slide deck you can use. We have training tips. We have the quiz that you took when you started the workshop with us that you can provide to your teachers. So like use the, we're, we're trying to say, hey, we modeled PD strategies. So go and do them in your, set, in your setting. It's, you know, the quote, train the trainer model. Um, so the requirement is to go through the, the wet educator site um, as a scavenger hunt, find certain things, and it gets submitted to us. And then the last is to write an integration plan, which is a really simple, loose lesson plan. It's like, okay, I learned about all these new res resources on Brain Pop. So now I'm going to bring them together and talk about how I'll integrate them into my classroom. So oh, I'm going to make concept maps about this and have students build them over the course of three weeks and do four different submissions so I can see their growth over time. And then I'm going to take a screenshot and put it into their CSOP portfolios. You know, great. That's a decent integration plan. We're not looking for detailed craziness, but we just want to see that you're thinking about application of everything you've learned within your teaching practice. And if you are not a teacher with students and you're leading PD, think about that. Um, so and there's one more requirement that's new. We have a movie making tool now where you can make your own movies. Um, it's kind of like an explain everything tool. You probably heard about that from Rashan um, a couple of weeks ago. But uh, Brain Pop now has that too. So if I, I'll show you that very quickly. And then I know it's, it's we're approaching end time. Um, but here I am on the Pi page. I click to make a movie icon, which is here. And it's gonna bring me into a very similar interface as the make a map, the concept map. But this is gonna allow me to create my own movie about Pi. So I can answer a letter that's already written. What's the difference between irrational, rational and irrational numbers? Or how is pi used to find the circumference of a circle? I'll choose that letter. I could also write my own if I wanted. And then I can, you know, bring in an image of pi. I could draw a little bit around it. Woo. Um, I can annotate with um, an arrow or whatever. And then, of course, I can go into sound and I can either use a computer voice and do um, text to speech, or I can record my own voice and it will add it to the sign. So I just drew a circle around 3.14159265.4. It's Pi Day. Um, and now it's processing and 
that saved it. And now here's my clip. So I just drew a circle around 3.14159264. It's pi day. So I save it, and now that clip, it's a scene maker. So now I can add another scene and continue recording my voice. So again, for, um, I forget the name of the person that said it for high school. This is a very useful tool for high school. In fact, I'm doing a webinar next week with a, one of our certified educators about it who said that one of the greatest moments for her is that the kids, they were going in to use this tool, and all they were doing is bringing in the text and typing in, typing in, because they were thinking of it as PowerPoint. And they're thinking of it as making a bad PowerPoint, <laughs> just putting in text, text, text. And she said, no, this isn't text. This is about animations and about drawing, and it's about visual explanations. It's very different. So it's a good opportunity to introduce students to different kinds of ways of expressing understanding. Um, and we think that uh, movies are slightly more compelling than, um, than, uh, than, than making PowerPoints or, or present slide presentations. Um, additionally, of course, students could organize their ideas in the concept map and then create the movie afterwards because they've already thought things through. So that's just a quick anecdote about the different kind of learning pathways that you could use through BrainPub. So I think this is like um, a, really, a really good example. I, I really, I, you know, you know, you've shown me things over the years and I've heard things over the years, but I really haven't dug into what you've been doing. And um, I think that this is like a really good model structure for what they could be, what my students could be doing with their, their benchmark project. Whether they'll go to this much detail, I don't think they will have time to, but, um, but some of these activities could be really adapted um, for what they're doing very easily. And, and the, whole, the whole thing about being an effective professional development person is you beg, borrow, and steal from other people oh. with, with credit, right? And, and that's how your practice evolves. And so, um, you know, and we're actively promoting that through this. We're, we're constantly saying, "Use what we're doing here. Yeah, we know yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. You know, and and we know it's good because we like when we run the numbers, we see that schools that have certified brain pop educators in them have a lot more activity than schools that don't. <laughs> you oh, know, that's how you activity know is not just like, oh, there's more accounts. We're saying students are creating more learning artifacts. You know. Um, those are some so, great, that's some great metrics to, to follow. Yeah. Um, it's late. I know it's super late where you are. I hope you had a snow day today at least. We did, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Um, but I want to, does anybody have any questions before we, we kick off for tonight? I think this was really, this has been a really good one-two punch of webinars. But if anybody has a question right now, grab the mic or type something. If not, I'll let everybody go. Um, no questions. Everybody's like, I want to get out of here and do my yeah. work. All right, Andrew, th this is awesome. I'm going to uh, post this probably tonight. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get into our course tonight, students, but it will be there in the next couple of days. But I'll have up on YouTube probably tonight. And, and, and Andrew, thank you so much for your time. This has been really great. And I'm so excited to have my students meet some of the people that I admire the most in, um, in the ed tech world. So this is, you're the final speaker that we're going to have next week. We're kind of going through our final presentations and wrapping up. So you're, you're our, you're our piece de resistance here. So thank you, Andrew. Oh, all right. Well, you're welcome. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to finish. I was going to say what, what's the value oh. of certified, but. It's, oh, do you want to worry about it? I reckon it's late. I'm tired too. Okay. But, uh, you know, you know the, people, uh, people can, can, people can leave if they want to. And then if you want to keep going, then it'll be in the recording. It's all, it's up to you. Um, and then we can wrap it up. I mean, that might be a nicer wrap up. Yeah. Let me just finish just cause okay. it's, okay. I guess, if you guys have to go, guys go, go, I go. Totally understand. we all have very long days, myself included. I just feel like it's a shame to leave it hanging. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I didn't realize we were hanging. So, no, okay. Um, so, so keep going, Andrew, cause I'm, I'm into this. Okay, so um, share screen. Yeah, I've got it. All right, you can see now, right? Yep. Okay, so this is, I always think was a nice. Um, this was from one of our um, online teachers in the online course. Um, she said, like after deconstructing the video with the concept mapping tool, I wanted to try it with the kids. I had four classes of second graders watch the Plant Life video. And then basically create a map in the same way. They had to find pause points. They had to find, um, let me see if I could draw on this, I would draw on it. Um, 
is there, yeah, there's annotates. So, you know, she had to find pause points and find facts, find a place where Moby beeps and tell what he means. So again, this was great. We weren't only modeling it for the teacher to do with the other teachers in the school. She did it with her students um, and thought it was a good assignment. So that was really nice. Um, and we get lots of decent anecdotes like that, which is good. Um, oh, wait, let me move on to the next slide. Let me move away. Right, okay. Matthew is asking, um, can, the, can the movies stand alone? Out of curiosity. Right now, they are not exportable from BrainPop, which we know is a big um, concern because, of course, we want to be able to give people the opportunity to share them, not only um, because kids want to show their families. I mean, kids could log into their accounts and show their families, but, you know, it would be a, a marketing bonanza for us if kids were posting their own BrainPop-style movies. Um, <laughs> But there's legal issues with um, proprietary stuff around um, our intellectual property. So we're, we're figuring out the share thing. Right now, there's, there's definitely value in producing a movie in and of itself. And there's ways that, you know, a teacher can sh share the movies that all the students have done with the class. Um, they just can't pull it outside of brain pop at this point. So it's a good question. Um, so what do we provide if you become certified? Well, um, we have a Google Plus community. There's about 550 people in it now because over the course of three years, we've certified that many people. We have events that are exclusive. So at conferences, we'll have like the CBE get together. Um, so we did one at FETC this year, at TCEA, at ISTE. Um, we do virtual field trips. So people come and get to interview people from Brain Pop, like our creative director, the voice of the characters, uh, the animators. Um, we do celebrations in New York for our local cohorts because we're based in New York. Um, we also have a direct line of brain poppers. So because through that uh, community, you know, our dev team is constantly posting stuff there and, and our, our project managers are asking questions and we're really, really listening to teacher input and teacher voice to try to improve our product. And that's really nice. Um, we also provide t-shirts and that kind of stuff. And there's a CBE of the month which certification certified brain pop educator of the month. So um, every month we choose a different certified educator to profile and they talk about what they're doing um, with brain pop and who they are. And they get a special avatar made in a brain pop style by our animators. So that's kind of nice. Um, so we keep in touch through the certification community. We also have a temporary community. So when people are going through the process, even if they don't, I mean, when they follow through, they get into the permanent community. But we have a, a process community as well where people can ask questions. But that's just temporary. Um, we also, for a while, we're doing the BPOP chat. We've put that on hiatus for a little while. We're developing a podcast now. Um, so we keep in touch through our, our different, uh, through Twitter for a while and, you know, primarily through our, our closed group. Um, people really, really like the course because we give so much concrete feedback um, so like they submit these four assignments but we're constantly trying to model hey this is how you give feedback on assignments too because we want them to be giving feedback to their students using brain pop um, so um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback we've also refined the structure over time so it's a um, the the course and the um, the certification requirements have improved because over time we've seen ways to uh, to make them better. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, there's a bunch, it's a bunch of work, probably takes accumulation of probably 15 hours if you're thorough. And we do see some people who probably cruise through the requirements like the day before they're due, and it's not great work. But ultimately, because we're not a, um, you know, we're not like an accredited, uh, um, credit providing entity. We're just, this is a certification. And if you boil it down to the most reductive element, it's basically marketing for brain pop. It's hard for me to say you can't be certified if you do all the work. And we don't have super detailed rubrics for each assignment because we have the expectation that they do decent work. And if they don't, we send it back. And if they reach the bare minimum, we'll call them certified um, because they did what we outlined was the bare necessity but we also make internal notes and we say hey these are these are you know of the 50 people that just got certified in this last cohort 
these 25 of them really did exemplary work and were articulating their ideas in really great ways. And that lets us know who we're going to make CBE of the month, who might we invite to present in our booth at a conference, who might we um, bring in for our advisory committee, because we have a certification advisory committee. Um, so we, we do, we pay attention to the submissions because it's useful for us to know who, who can, um, who's, who's out, who out there is talking about this stuff articulately. Um, and because we feel good about the kind of work that people can do with brain pop, if they use it well, it's not only an ambassador for being brain pop, but it's an ambassador for good, good teaching. Um, because we want to see people deconstructing content and thinking about how to use things in creative ways. And that's what our assignments ask them to do. Um, so that's also turned into us also selling professional development. So even if we're not at a conference or you can't get into our online course, we will come to a, um, to a school or a district. And that's been interesting. We have a few full-time trainers now. Um, and, uh, you know, we built out five different courses, one around differentiation, one around S, um, assessment, one around, um, STEM and STEAM initiatives, one around integration. Um, and, uh, anyone that follows through on, or anyone that attends any of those PD courses at a school or district can choose to become certified and follow through on the certification requirements. So that's an option for them because we know they've at least had, uh, the, the teaching strategies model. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically what I wanted to get through is, you know, there's the requirements, but then there's benefits and then there's ways that it's growing for us as well. Um, and, uh, I'll kind of leave it at that. <laughs> I think it's great. I mean, and you, I mean, this has all been done since you started there five or six years ago. I mean, that's, it, it takes a while to develop these things and to do it thoughtfully. And clearly it's working for you guys because you're seeing, more engaged teachers and more in like you said before the artifacts as evidence and i i right. i think that kind of metric beyond test scores is really important like what other kinds of numbers can you look at to know whether your your program or your experience or whatever is effective and right that's a, another takeaway for me from this the big challenge for us now is scaling it because we want to continue to make this a very high touch experience you know through feedback and, and modeling strategies but you know we get hundreds of submissions now from these certified these aspiring certified educators and it takes a while to evaluate them um so we're you know we've kind of explored like the apple teacher program and how it's really simple and not particularly deep but we may create like a mid-tier certification in a similar vein because we want people to still be comfortable with these tools and use them effectively but we just can't scale the, the, the certification at the, at the rate that we want to. So I've been looking into that. So uh, that's one thing that we haven't talked about in our class is, is the Apple teacher program. And you guys might want to take a, I, I may have mentioned it before, but it's, you know, I think it's been going for a couple months, everyone. It's Apple's badging um, initiative to reach kind of new users it doesn't take very long to do it. A friend of mine did it the other night in about an hour. Yeah, it takes um, like a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for the, for the former APD trainer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I've had mixed feelings. I don't know what you think about it, Corey, but I've had, you know, uh, um, Andrew and I've talked about it a lot. And I, I, I don't know. I've, I, I guess it has its place because they're, they're really trying to reach new users as opposed to, you know, the, the nerds like us. Uh, but it's really basic. I, w I thought it was their attempt at the Google One, Google yeah. One level educator. That's what they, I thought they were going after. Yeah, but that was my too. But like Google just has more tools. Google has more options in their tools. Like Apple has ADE. Stick to ADE. It's amazing. I just, I don't know. But I also, I also think, you know, like there's a lot of rhetoric now around micro-credentialing and badging. Um, and this is Apple's attempt to also try to right. get in on that too. And, you know, I, I've explored that deeply. We all started creating micro-credentials for BrainPop and ultimately decided, you know what, we're not going to be the, we're not going to be the who, the issuer, we're going to be the how. Okay. We're going to be the tool that people use to earn the differentiation micro-credential from Digital Promise or the Buck Institute project-based learning one. You know, BrainPop can be a component 
of hundreds of micro credentials. Right. You know, even like teaching number lines, you know, like there's a micro credential about that. Yeah. Um, did I tell you, I, did I show you, I know I, my students obviously heard about it, um, but um, Chrome Warrior, Andrew, where you can make challenges. It's more, yeah, it's, you told me about it. I, I just, yeah. you, here's, here's Q's game that they, they have open right now. So you guys can all see what it looks like in practice. Um, join it and take a look at it. And you can, there's actually a couple of, um, uh, they call them sorties uh, to do if you're not at Q for the virt people who are watching virtually and that sort of thing. So take a look at that. I like it because you can design your own thing and it takes a while to do it and it takes thought. You can't just whip it out and, you know, I don't know. You can make it a little bit more sophisticated and um, than other platforms out there and, and customize it to what you're doing. The other piece about Chrome Warrior is that these sorties that you develop, these activities, go into a library that's shared with other districts who buy the, the program, which I think is really appealing. Like you could, you could take stuff that's made by another teacher and repurpose it. Right. The, prob the problem is, is that it's not free. And I've, you know, I've suggested to them that they make a, a free edition or you know, a Chrome Warrior Lite or something so that people play with it. Otherwise, the only time that they're gonna get experience with it is when, you know, unless their district really invests in it, the time to develop it, um, they're only going to get the experience if they go to a conference or someplace where Chrome Warrior has a, a public presence. Mm. So anyway, you, you might want to take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, the big challenge for me, you know, this is getting micro, but is I want to be able to have the entire BrainPop light certification process happen within BrainPop. I don't want to have to go to a third-party product. And that's been a challenge because BrainPop is – is better than it was three years ago, but it's still very limited in the way we can track individual, um, you know, work without having it be high touch. You know, there's not a lot of automation in it. Um, so that's something that uh, I've been thinking about a lot. Cool. Um, okay. Anyone else have any thoughts or comments uh, for Andrew? And, you know, I, you know, the, 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 the point of this was not to be a, a brain pop commercial per se, although I was very, I'm very interested in learning more about all these cool things that he showed us, but really to kind of talk about the process that he's gone through mm -hmm. to develop this and what it looks like to be part of the program and how intentional it's been. And I think for me, like getting to the end of this course, I think that's kind of the takeaway because I've been learning along with you guys is being intentional in everything that we do with our with, with professional development. It's really important um, that we get it right and that we have the right vibe, that we have the right activities, that we have the right attitude. There's so many things that play to make professional learning successful. And, um, and so this is just, you know, I think hearing Andrew's story is, is, is really valuable. Um, so Andrew, where are you gonna be next? You guys are gonna be at ISTE. Uh, you know, if any of us are coming, we should, look for you in the, in the brain pop booth with Moby. Yeah, we just, we just uh, put out the application for the, uh, for our certification courses there. We have a classroom. So if you're there, you can come to the brain pop classroom. We call it the pop-up classroom. Um, and uh, so we, we'll lead a few certification courses there um, and just have a like, general overview sessions. And we're going to have a movie contest and we're going to spray ah. paint Moby bobbleheads and give them out as little, little Oscars. It's going to be very cute. I have um, my I, I I have a bobblehead that I was supposed to take a picture of. So, you don't have to. No, Andrew sent Andrew sent me one of the bobbleheads, and you were supposed to take a picture of it and post it. Like I don't know what the hashtag was to Twitter. And my, you weren't, my, no, that would there was a hashtag, but there was no there was no expectation that you oh, did that. Oh, but I would I, I I totally forgot to to follow through on it. But my husband did take a picture of Moby in our freezer. I don't know why he put Moby in a freezer, but Moby is in our is in our kitchen looking at us every day. So uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 the reason that I kind of responded like that is I was very concerned that I didn't want to be one of those companies that's like, here's something you must tweet about it, sure. like because it's fun, like it's where, where's Moby is the hashtag, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so we wanted to like, you know, people did have it all around the world and there's some fun Where's Moby if you look at it on Twitter. And it was not, we weren't trying to force that in any way. Oh, you did, it wasn't. It's really lame when companies are like, you must tweet about us to be certified or something like that. Like that yeah. I think is really problematic. And that's where like the marketing side trumps the education side. And one thing that I'm kind of proud of with my, with the, the, the 
the certification course that you know I represent is that I think there is a good good pedagogy and good um, educational uh, you know theory underlying it. It's not just marketing. And and I think this is I think that's important. I think um, as the people in this course as their careers progress. I think they need to think about like when they're evaluating companies that they're working with in their schools, do they have a, do they have a, an education core is education in their DNA? Like Apple likes to say, I think it makes a huge difference. It also, I think it's important to think about um, as your career takes off the people in this program, the start of my career taking off really began at NLU and in, in, in this program. And um and I think thinking about the different ways that your how education manifests itself in other in other fields or or, or in other other ways, uh, you don't have to stay in, in a school for the rest of your life. You can you can impact education and do interesting things with teachers in other contexts. And and so I think that's what's interesting about your story, Andrew. Too is. Um, is that there's either you have other pathways that open up to you, you know, because of the ed tech angle. Well, yeah. Wow. And I think, you know, like Corey, I did Apple professional development for three summers and I don't know how long you did it for Corey, but, um, oh. yeah, I did it for, yeah, I'm still going. Oh, you're still going. Yeah. It was well, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Do you um, know, did you guys know each other during doing, doing EPD? I was, um, I, I don't know. When were you there? Or when did you start doing that? Three years ago now. Okay. Yeah. I stopped in 2011. I was doing it from 08 to 11. Yeah. Okay. Um, who was your, what, what, what region were you in? Who was your, who did you, who's your boss, I guess? Well, I wasn't, I was a contractor, so I would do it in the summers. Um, right. And that was when a guy named Jerry used to run it. And Jerry. then Ray was underneath Jerry. Um, I had a Paul. <laughs> yeah. Paul, uh, Paul, um, let me look it up. Yeah. Uh, Paul Tarantiles. Yeah. 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 yeah I like Paul. Um, no, but you know, the beauty of that when I did it is I was literally flying around the country and doing training. So you just, you get this incredible sense of different schools around the world, around the country. Um, and like, what is, it just, it just widens your scope. You know, that was really it. Like a lot, you know, I work with a lot of teachers and a lot of people are really focused on, their you know their community which is great which is what you should be focused on which is what i was focused on when i taught for 12 years but starting to do the apple stuff for the last three years i was in the classroom it just broadened my scope i could see i could see bigger than just my own community um which you know in some ways is sad because i was probably a pretty good teacher and i'm no longer teaching um and i like you know i go to bed at night feeling semi okay about myself because i feel like i'm still sticking to my values in education and I feel like when I'm out there and trying to influence people it's in good ways but you know when push comes to shove I'm not doing the real the real work anymore but you know um, I think I, I think it's okay I think it's okay I think, I think, no I say you know I, I go to bed feeling okay about that but <laughs> not as good as I used to <laughs> you know? um, and you know I'm working for a for-profit I make a much better living than I did as a teacher um, I have a much easier lifestyle, even though I work hard. And that's the thing. Like if you leave, if you're a good teacher and you work hard and you leave and you go into the private sector, they're like, whoa, like you have an amazing work ethic. Like, because some people in the private sector just don't work as hard as teachers do. I don't know. This is, this is me being a little preachy. You said that last week and I thought that was really interesting. You know, I just think like, you know, if, if you're a, if you're a go-getter teacher, you never take that hat off. I mean, I remember in the weekends, you're like walking down the street and you see some shapes and you take a picture because you want to show it to your first graders on Monday. Like that's the kind of lens you have as an educator um, if you're good at it. Um, and, um, you know, if you start having that kind of lens towards your professional job, they're psyched <laughs> because you're working towards their bottom line. You're not working towards like the betterment of kids. Um, so. That's awesome. That's a, that's a really good, um, I hadn't thought of that that way. And, and I, I don't really work in that kind of study and I work for myself. So I don't know, yeah. I don't know what it's like to work for another company that might appreciate my work ethic. Um, but I really love this. I think this is like the crowning touch on this. And, um, 
and really good advice to my students. So Andrew, thank you again for doing this. And if I can ever repay it you for, you know, if I can ever do anything for you in return, I'd be happy to. And uh, I hope you, I have done so much for me my entire professional career. So there's Aww. a loop I can do to replay you. Okay, <laughs> well, it's great where you are. Um, I, hope, right. I hope you get to meet some of these people at ISTE and that sort of thing, because I think you'll really like them. And, um, and yeah, just one last clarifying yeah, point yeah, yeah, yeah. about that, the, you know, corporation earning money. Brainbox is a wonderful company that is not as bottom line driven as many, many companies out there. It's almost a B Corp. Um, there's no venture capital underlying it. It was founded by a, a, a um, pediatrician. So I don't want to make it sound like <laughs> money hungry, grubbing company because it really isn't. And, you know, they, they treat me so, so well. Um, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of speaking in a detached way there for a minute. Like Brain Pop does take really good care of me. And um, I so appreciate working for them because it could be a much more cutthroat um, corporate I think, than it is. I think their, their, their corporate values speak for themselves. I mean, you've always said it's a very family driven, family oriented company. Yeah. And, um, and I think it's possible to have a balance and it seems like they do. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, I just wanted to clarify that. Before. Right. Okay. It's no, before somebody listens to it. No, uh, <laughs> you were fine, Andrew. You're awesome. All right. Uh, Corey, I hope you get, I hope Corey in particular, I know you would really like Andrew in person. So I hope you guys get to meet some oh, time. I mean, Andrew, I can tell you right now, just when I was an, uh, I was one of the iPad teachers when the first ones brain pop was on our devices guaranteed. My old district, man, you guys, we had it in elementary middle school. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, it's a it's a beloved product, that's for sure. Yeah. The problem is, it's beloved for its movies, and we're a lot more than that, and no one we, knows that. And we used to use the quiz feature, like the built-in quizzes, like a little like reading quizzes afterwards the kids liked. Yeah. Um, but I know you guys have been growing so much over the yeah. past few years. And in fact, the crazy thing is, like, our best marketing is through the App Store through Apple, but the, it's a least it's our least robust um, experience. Like, yeah, it is. It is. In Safari, it's much more robust than playing with our Brain Pop app. Right. So there's a counterintuitive element there. Um, I, I can't stress it enough at these trainings. I'm like, don't go to the app. Go to the site. <laughs> <laughs> that, that can be our final word there. Don't go to the app. Go to the site. Right. All right, guys. I got to go pack and get ready for California. You Have guys a blast awesome. out there. I will. And uh, I'll get this posted as soon as I can. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks. Nice chatting with you all. Take care. Bye.